Good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, Michael Ignatius, Rector and President of Central European University, and it's a, I want to welcome everybody uh, from our community, but also extend a very warm welcome to our friends and colleagues from uh, Budapest, from our fellow institutions across Budapest. Uh, extend a particularly warm welcome to members of the diplomatic community who are here in strength. Extremely grateful to see them. Oh my God, there are a lot of you ambassadors today. Holy smoke. Very impressive. So you've all got to behave here. We've got, you know, representatives of governments in the room. So we've got to clean up our act. So there we are. It's just a joke. No, seriously, it's a great pleasure to welcome members of the diplomatic community here. Um, we regard this as one of the things that CEU can do for general enlightenment. Uh, and now we have a, um, a great uh, treat in store because uh, we have a, a friend of CEU in the house. John Connolly is a extremely distinguished historian of Central and Eastern Europe and has been part of the CU community for a very long time. As you know, he's the Sidney Hellman Airman Professor of History and Director of the Institute for East European Eurasian and Slavic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. It's a long title and it's a great university. And John has um, furthered and promoted the study of this vital part of Europe um, on the west coast of the United States for a very, very long time. He's the author of a number of previous books, but I'm going to focus on the one that he'll be talking about today, which is From Peoples into Nations, A History of Eastern Europe, a book that I have praised on its jacket, which I don't often do, but do in this case because it is... Um, panoramic history from the 18th century to the present, vivid, beautifully organized, powerfully written, very well illustrated, by the way. Um, a big book, but a book that you can read with a dawning sense of just how much the history of this region uh, has to teach us about the current uh, configurations of politics in this region, particularly why in a region where nationalism has had, and national mobilization has had such tragic, often catastrophic consequences, nationalism remains the chief organizing principle of politics in this region. The book essentially tries to think about that important para paradox which remains as relevant right now here in 2020 as it ever was. Um, so John will speak to us. Uh, he has notes. Look at that. He's got a he's got a talk here. He's taken off his jacket, so he's ready for serious business. Um, I'd like him to speak for maybe about 45 minutes, and then so we have time for questions. Uh, the event will continue promptly until no later than 7 p.m., and then we'll give you a drink afterwards. I ask you to make a Warm welcome to our friend John Connolly. Thank you. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. And I'm really delighted to be with you again, and, and, and I hope this will be one among many visits over the years. Uh, so a continuation from past into future. Um, my subject today is my book, um, which is lying outside, and I'm astounded myself at how big it is, actually. Um, and I'll be happy uh, to autograph copies for you afterwards, if you're interested. Um, but obviously, the first question when you encounter a book, large or small, is why the book? Why the subject? Uh, and in this case, why a book on Eastern Europe? There are actually a lot of books out there on Eastern Europe. I think my basic goal was to explain to readers as I've tried to to my students for the last 30 years, why the region, in fact, is a region. Um, what is it that makes Eastern Europe distinct, interesting, and perhaps even instructive? In existing works, the trend uh, 
has been to say that Eastern Europe is a creation of outsiders, of Western travelers and thinkers in particular, and that if Eastern Europe exists at all, it's an area, uh, it's an idea, idea imposed upon a region from people from the outside. Um, in fact, Eastern Europe, we are told, is not really that different from other places. People talk these days about global Europe, you may have heard. Uh, one of my colleagues in my respect talks about a global Poland. I see at the most recent American Historical Association meeting, there was a panel on the global and transnational Habsburg Empire. We live in an age which aspires to diversity, but hesitates to say that any human community might be distinctive. But from the first times I visited Eastern Europe in the 1970s, that is Poland and then Czechoslovakia and Hungary, it struck me that I was encountering something very special here, that this was a place of unusual sensitivity to history where the events and deeds of earlier times mattered in ways I had not encountered before. It was a place where people thought of history as akin to a personality, a person who might intervene in one's life and the life of one's family, who might knock at the door, uh, might be the guest who is seated at the living room and never leaves, a guest who did not suffer being ignored. History in Eastern Europe was a presence that might suddenly disrupt all conventions, the entire built world of towns and cities, and reveal them as what they are, products of history. If I can give a, an example of this sensitivity, I think of the poet Czesław Miłosz, who taught at Berkeley for a number of years. Once, one, get, one gets a sense in his recollections of Warsaw right at the end of the war, um, that this was a place where the pavement and streets were not fully formed, they were like liquid, liquid that could escape the temporary form given in stone or asphalt. This point was even more true of political and economic systems, all of which naive people in the West believed were eternal and unchanging. Is this kind of historical sensitivity unique? It's not. I'm currently a, a resident scholar at Queen's University in Belfast, and virtually everything one learns about the past has a parallel. Um, has, the past there has a parallel in Eastern Europe. What Ireland shares with Eastern Europe is three things. First, more than one people living in the same space and considering it their own. Second, one of these people seeming to be post-imperial. Third, uh, these several peoples having a sense of the community's fate being at the mercy of larger forces, especially larger states. What's unusual about Eastern Europe is how this kind of sensitivity of being part of a small people subject to the whims of larger peoples is reproduced across a band of earth. Eastern Europe is like a series of ulsters from the Baltic to the Adriatic Seas with differing combinations of mixed identities on small limited territories wedged between imperial peoples to the east and to the west. Aside from being very conscious of very old history and being able to tell you the, not only the date but the time of day that a battle may have taken place hundreds of years ago, Eastern Europe has produced more than its share of new history, indeed much of what we associate with the 20th century, its wars and social movements and political ideologies and grand experiments and failures, as well as superb culture, its Miwoshes and Kerteshes, Kunderes, Krauses and Andriches, was experienced, this century was experienced more intensely in Eastern Europe than anywhere else. Which gets to the next question, why is the book so long, why is it so big? If from an international perspective, the 20th century was where the action was in the past, why does the book start all the way back in the 1780s? The answer is that the book was originally commissioned to be a history of the 20th century, but after a while, I concluded that this century, the 20th century, didn't make good sense, any sense in terms of itself. One had to go back. The point was even truer of the smaller time units like the interwar years. There are books on the interwar years or the post-World War II years. There are great books on those periods. But I found that by imprisoning time in small units, it seemed one was failing to project basic comprehension of what has happened to the region and to the world. Um, this point was usually related to the national question, the so-called national question. Why was it that right after World War I, a series of new nation states based in the virtuous and straightforward principle of national self-determination of democracy did not work out. That Slovakia became a problem for Czechoslovakia or Croatia for Yugoslavia. Why were Hungary or Germany so revisionist or irredentist? Why was there so little regional cooperation? Why was there a slide virtually everywhere toward authoritarianism?
In a long-term view, one sees that there were a range of challenges to the region after World War I, for example, of infrastructure, development, monoculture. But the basic one was that large and small powers made claims on territory or populations which did not belong to them. Such problems were impossible to explain without probing the history of the earlier generations. What I found is that an initially long introduction to the 20th century in my book manuscript, an introduction on the 18th and 19th century, kept growing from one into two chapters, and then at the encouragement of my editor, eventually into 10, maybe even 12 chapters. Therefore, the book features an expansive view of time, time before and after 1918, that I hope opens perspectives that were closed to people who lived in the generation of 1919, of that moment when the new Eastern Europe emerged. The way, for example, that the new states were not nation states, but miniature Habsburg empires that replicated the problems of imperial rule that went back centuries. And isn't that the deeper purpose of history, to tell us things not evident to people who lived close to the events that we're talking about? The expanse of time makes it possible, almost over 200 years, to focus on single events, but also broad patterns, perhaps a bit like the way a huge telescope, taking in lots of light, can reveal details of celestial bodies otherwise not visible, while at the same time at lower mag magnification, permitting one to probe deeper systems and structures. I made the starting point the 1780s, because it was from then that we can trace the emergence and spread of the national idea in Eastern Europe, thanks largely to the Austrian monarch, Joseph II who inadvertently did something of great import for all that followed during his decade of sole rule, 1780 to 1790. He attempted to introduce German, the German language, into his realm as the language of administration and education. And by doing so, caused many Hungarians and some Czechs to fear they would just become one more group in Central Europe of German speakers, of which there were many already. He made them fear that they would disappear from history as a people. Petitions rained upon the court in Vienna from all over Hungary. Inhabitants of one county evoked the fate of the Etruscan city of Vey. Who remembered them now? Like them, it seemed, the Magyars would simply disappear from Hungary. I'm sorry, from history. In the words of the historian Eva Balac, in a book produced by Central European University Press, I might add, Joseph II had touched some deep nerve, bringing dormant feelings to the surface, ushering in a new phase of national development. Joseph was insensitive to all pleas, and a generation later, the concern over national disappearance had spawned political movements, first striving for cultural rights, then gradually for forms of political autonomy. So in response to the impossible question of where Eastern Europe is, I say it is a region of sometimes shifting political, bound, uh, political and physical boundaries of small peoples living between empires who are characterized by a special fear, stoked for generations by their political classes, that they as peoples might disappear from history. I don't entirely exclude Germans from the story, though Germany is not an East European country. But Germans belong because East European thinkers learned what it is to be national from Germans. The story is basically of young men of the early 19th century, mostly from today's Slovakia, overwhelmingly theologians, who instead of bringing people to God, ultimately decided to bring their peoples to a full sense of their national identities. And that explains the book's title. This was a project, making peoples into nations. This was their project. In the years after Napoleon's defeat, the aspiring clergymen arrived in the German city of Jena to study theology, but found themselves in a hotbed of German nationalism, of early German liberal nationalism. It was a left-wing phenomenon. The early German nationalists whom they encountered had felt humiliated by the way that French imperial forces had dictated the fortunes of their nation, wiping its weak political form, the Holy Roman Empire, off the map in 1806. That left the question of where Germany was, if Germany had no state. The answer the thinkers found, the German thinkers found, was in language. Likewise, the young East European patriots portrayed their nation, their nations also lacking states um, as united in common language and culture. Where was Slovakia? It was where people spoke Slovak. Where was Germany? It was where people spoke German. Thus, this so-called ethnic nationalism, which characterized the German and East European lands, 
is not eternal or necessary, but emerges whenever ethnicity itself is threatened. Ethnic nationalism is a response to that threat. These young men, following the German thinker Herder, became convinced that each nation, with its language as its soul, stood in a special relation to God and had a, mes a mission to humanity and to history. The young patriots then had to work out the tricky question of exactly what language was their language? What was the language of Czechs and Slovaks? Did they share a language, perhaps? Uh, what was the language of the South Slavs? They and their collaborators made dictionaries uh, and thought they were helping their nations to a new, secure life. Two prominent figures among them in the early 19th century actually met and talked at length here in, uh, in Pest, actually, not, a, I don't believe in Buddha, in Pest in the, in, in the 1830s, the Slovak Lutheran Jan Kolar and the Croat Ludovic Gai, actually became close friends here in Budapest um, and arguably made the ideas of Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia right here. Um, people inspired by their ideas made the Czechoslovak and Yugoslav states in 1918. Unfortunately, they did not consult the populations of these new states whether they believed they were Czechoslovaks or Yugoslavs. So now I'm going to shift to the second part of my presentation, which is this uh, disastrous 20th century, um, which rightly people have dated from World War I. Um, I'd like to talk about three controversial episodes of the 20th century that characterize the 20th century that feature prominently in the book, 1918, 1933, and 1945. What do we make of the creation and then, and then breakdown of the new nation states after World War I? Was fascism the destiny of the region? Was communism a simple imposition on an unwilling set of populations? Are East Europeans victims? As you may know, there is a prominent historical exhibition in the city that does make that point. My general approach to the first date, 1918, one could go into 1919, is in keeping with a trend in the literature, which rather than celebrate the new nation states as expressions of long suppressed desires for independence, discerns the way they emerged as a major reason for their failure and the failure of the interwar settlement. The fulfillment of the dreams of nationalists produced in a region where no borders could be drawn between ethnicities and the lands they claimed, that combustible material that made the breakdown of democracies, the irredentist states of the 1930s, um, possible, perhaps even unavoidable. But I think I also differ in the approach to many historians currently writing on the subject, because these historians t have tended to expend a lot of energy trying to show how the nation state formation after World War I might not have happened at all. Special attention has focused on the Habsburg monarchy. It might have continued and managed and evolved into a democratic federation of states. Um, now this belief, this belief that the Habsburg Empire might have evolved into something like a federation uh, makes perfect sense for critical historians because we tend to oppose the easy assumptions of national historiography according to which the foundation of nation states in 1918 was a necessary, even virtuous thing, the crowning moment of Polish or Czech history. Questioning such nationalist narratives is not unique to historians of Eastern Europe. I'm currently in Belfast, and I have a colleague named Fiergal McGarry. I'm attending his lectures on, on, on Irish history. And when he talks about the years before the forming of the Irish Free State, he likes to stress the following, these are taken from his lecture. Still, let us be cautious about the idea that something inevitable might have been happening. McGarry takes special issue with the popular idea in, among Irish nationalists that 1922 was the crowning moment of generations of struggle and hard work, what the poet W.B. Yeats called a long gestation, the idea that national independence was not only preceded, but necessitated by generations of preparation, the crowning glory of nationalist work. One has to sympathize, I think, with the approach of McGarry and many colleagues who do East European history, because after all, if you say that everything that happened was destined to happen, what is there to talk about? Counterfactuals are the tool that historians use to open minds to virtually every aspect of historical explanation, take out a certain factor, what would have happened? They're indispensable. 
But I think one can go too far with counterfactual thinking. The Habsburg monarchy was not a gentle multinational colossus that was suddenly sucked into war. Instead, it was a prime agent causing that war. And it did so not as a gent gentle state standing above the nationality conflicts, but as a dysfunctional, deeply authoritarian entity whose upper tiers, statesmen, were obsessed by nationalism. Nationality conflict didn't simply happen to the Habsburg leadership. It governed their dreams and their acts. They themselves were as nationalist as any of their subject peoples, believing that war with the Slavs was inevitable, and that tiny Serbia, with its three millions, was a force that had to be stopped at all costs because it governed the loyalties of its own subject peoples, the South Slavs, um, more effectively than they ever might hope to. Maybe these statesmen were right. Whatever one makes of that argument, uh, after the Sarajevo assassination, which I really do think was a so-called contingent event, and I could talk about that, after that assassination and the Austro-Hungarian declaration of war in 1914, it's hard to imagine any serious alternative to the decline of Russia and the other imperial powers. By 1918, the monarch monarchical rule was sapped of legitimacy. It was clearly a system of yesterday. And national self-determination seemed the only argument left standing. Once we arrive at that argument in 1918 or 1919, and it was really general throughout East and Central Europe, it's hard to imagine alternatives to the post-war order and its subsequent breakdown. The other really contingent event in the early 20th century, in my view, besides the Sarajevo assassination, um, in making the 20th century and its horrors uh, was Berlin, January 30th, 1933, Hitler's appointment as Reich Chancellor, which, like Gavrilo Princip's act, one can easily imagine not happening. Before Sarajevo, one could conceive of a Europe or imagine a Europe without fascism. Before January 30th, 1933, one could imagine a Europe without genocide. Still, to say that it's hard to conceive of history transpiring very, very differently, save those two turning points, does not mean there's nothing to learn from the history of Eastern Europe after 1918, especially when one sees that US foreign policy, especially since 2002, has transpired as though the experiment of 1918-1919 of nation state building and of democratization had never happened. You can seek in vain any, any reference to this as, as, as a potential lesson in history uh, from the, the years 2002-2003. In the book, I offer two p potential lessons. Um, first, um, from the failure of the interwar settlement. First, the first focuses, uh, uh, first is an explanation of the, of the failure of the interwar settlement that focuses indeed on misguided foreign policy, in particular on the ignorance of the creators of the interwar settlement, uh, which combined with idealism to produce a fatal uh, and tragic outcome. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson believed that if one simply transplanted democratic institutions from the West, that they would take root and grow almost as if democracy were the default position of governance once monarchy was abolished. But he and innumerable contemporaries who intervened in history had little sense of the difficulties in making nation states in East Central Europe. Um, in partial defense of these men, um, one might note that knowledge on what we now call area studies, and for me, area studies is something holy, was very thin on the ground 100 years ago. There was um, just one person on Woodrow Wilson's 100-person fact-finding team called the Inquiry who knew something. He knew anything, actually, about the multinational character of Bohemia or Hungary. Um, but for easily comprehensible reasons, this man did nothing to warn the president of the complications lying ahead. This man was Robert J. Kerner, Harvard PhD in history, 1911, later a professor at, hate to say it, UC Berkeley, but also a man who had been born of Czech parents in Chicago. So he was an enthusiast rather than a critic of the new nationalism in Eastern Europe, in particular of T.G. Masaryk, with whom he had studied in Prague, um, and whom he, like Wilson, trusted. Um, Kerner, therefore, did little to warn his boss about the existence of Germans in Bohemia and said that Czechoslovaks and Yugoslavs as peoples were a scientific fact. 
The self-righteousness of Americans was, of course, matched, easily matched, by a heavy dose of self-righteousness righteousness among local elites. Czechs, for example, believed that Bohemia, in some essential way, was Czech. And the Germans there, if they were there, were guests. Uh, this self-righteousness uh, combined with greed, uh, for example, among Czech and Romanian elites, who took every square meter that they, they could from the defeated Hungary including lots of land right along the new borders with concentrated Magyar populations. Trianon, like Versailles, was intended to be punitive. So I argue that somewhat less blithe self-righteousness in US foreign policy blended with hypocrisy and vindictiveness, vindictiveness in establishing post-war boundaries, especially those of Hungary and Germany, might have taken some of the edge off interwar irredentism. Another lesson available in retrospect, unfortunately, like all historical lessons, is that federal style rule with room for regional aut autonomy, especially uh, for Slovakia or Croatia, might have reduced room for autonomous movements that made Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, uh, and, and made Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia sounder entities. As it, as it is, both of those states were ruled centrally. So from, from, from Prague and from Belgrade. Even the Croat leader Stepan Radic, before his death in 1928, recognized that Croatia needed Yugoslavia for its security. Intellectually speaking, other kinds of outcomes were, uh, were possible, um, but not conceivable in that period. So my second point, World War II and fascism. What about 1933? This major turning point leading to the outbreak of war in Europe um, the coming to power of Hitler was not in any way predetermined, but was the result of machinations. It didn't, wasn't necessitated by German history. Um, took place as the result of machinations that um, occurred in January 1933 among right, uh, identifiable small group of right-wing German elites. From that point, from the appointment of Hitler as Reich Chancellor, the story is pretty well known of his eliminating rivals, of his taking advantage of Western pacifism and duplicity, the only person who seemed to play out of script in those years was Winston Churchill in 1940, when he engineered an unlikely resistance among British elites to Hitler, um, Hitler's attempts to claim power in the continent. But his, Churchill's, was not the only note of defiance. In contrast to governing narratives, I portray the region not as how somehow congenitally predisposed to fascism. In fact, Fascism in East Central Europe was a marginal force, gaining mass pop popularity only in two places, Romania and Hungary, and coming to power nowhere on its own. A lot of the explanation for this is unromantic. Fascism was weak among Czechs, Serbs, or Poles because it was associated with the national enemy, mostly Germany, also Italy. And it was crushed in Romania and Hungary, not due to democratic tradition, but due to the strength of authoritarian rule. In the book, I therefore speak of East European anti-fascism, and I also highlight moments of defiance of the small states against the emergent Nazi superpower, 1939 and 1941, when Polish and then Serb elites, supported by broad swaths of their populations, defied Hitler and the plans he had for Poland and Yugoslavia to become Germany's allies. Specialists may know about this, uh, but the book is not written for specialists, purely for specialists. Um, I think non-specialists are often surprised to learn that in early 1939, the German government actually courted Poland for an alliance that would be directed against the USSR. Hitler imagined Poland as an ally. The Polish government said no, and though its security was guaranteed by Britain and France, was essentially, essentially the country absorbed the Nazi onslaught alone in the late summer of 1939. In March 1941, Serb military officers in Belgrade staged a coup against their own government's recent accession to a pact with Germany, which in turn brought the German army into Yugoslavia. This had not been the German plan. One could argue this defiance directed war in ways Hitler had not intended and helped lead to his defeat. Because of the need for Germany to subdue Yugoslavia, the attack on the Soviet Union took place later than, what, than it was intended. Now, one can easily romanticize or heroicize these stories and of course, there were many heroes. But the long-term perspective makes clear that these two acts of defiance by Polish and Serb elites supported by their populations made a lot of sense in terms of the story told about the nation in each of these people going back generations. 
what I call insurrectionary nationalism, implying that compromise in matters of national sovereignty was unacceptable. So now comes the tricky part when talking about fascism. As is well known, Serbia and Poland were quickly subdued. They indeed were crushed. Were these and other societies simply victims? This has become part of official narratives as seen in, in a monument on Liberty Square here in Budapest or in a Polish law forbidding the claim that the Polish nation was complicit in totalitarianism. My answer is simply that research shows that generalizations, like all generalizations, about a whole nation are untenable. Some relatively few Poles collaborated. Some relatively more opposed Nazi rule. The majority tried above all to survive. Behavior was differentiated, and I think we're only beginning to learn how and why. Third scenario, communism, what about that? So I, I would argue two things that seem not to, not to fit together. Of course, Eastern Europe was a victim of communism. There's no question about that. Very few East Europeans invited or hoped for Soviet-style rule. This rule was a violent imposition upon the region at the cost of tens of thousands of dead, as well as populations of deportees and political prisoners running into hundreds, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions. However, one must also note that the Soviets were very thin on the ground in Eastern Europe, and guidelines for imposing the new system were very imprecise, even in culture and education. And thus we find not just thousands, but hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of accomplices, maybe not willing at first, but very effective, what I call self-Sovietizers, making Warsaw or Prague resemble Moscow by 1955 in many ways. And from the late 1950s, producing a range of different kinds of national communist regimes adapted to local circumstances, from Kadar to Gierek to Ceausescu. After it was all over, after the revolutions of 1989, many of us thought communism would simply be shaken off as a foreign system with no problem. But here we are, 30 years later, discovering that communism has gone very deeply into Eastern Europe's psyche. The Polish Catholic philosopher Józef Tischner spoke of homo sovieticus, and he was speaking of homo sovieticus after 1989. This was a certain type of personality that became a mass phenomenon, not willing to take responsibility for his or her own deeds, not able to think independently, always full of demands, always ready to blame others, sickly suspicious, consumed by unhappiness. Above all, Homo Sovieticus was certain that communism was something that he or she did not participate in. What I've always found remarkable and revealing was that dissidents, precisely those who devoted their energies to opposing communism, people like Václav Havel, Adam Michnik, George Conrad, Roland Jan, all emphasized that to varying degrees, everyone was involved, part of the system, including themselves, the dissidents. Today's populists claim otherwise, that there was us and there was them, the virtuous nation versus the Soviet lackeys. Um, and of course, they use this argument to reinforce their own power. But they, too, are creatures of the old system. In a recent interview, the solidarity activist Władysław Frasyniuk said that Poland's current prime minister, Morawiecki, the man who undoes the liberal separation of powers because he says Polish judges are holdovers from communist days 30 years later, is himself a creation of communist times. To quote Frosinyuk, Marowiecki completed communist schools. He studied at a university of people's Poland, of communist Poland. He was taught by communists and then by post-communists. In other words, he is a communist bastard and his children and grandchildren will be post-communist bastards. We are a generation educated and shaped, we, we are a generation educated and shaped by the former system, a fact that has consequences. We now know that it, is e that it is easier to win the freedom of borders than to become free human beings. The premier longs for the old system, Morawiecki. Governing was easy back then. The first secretary gave an order and everybody from the premier to the chairman of the municipal national council to the presidents of the courts complied. Now peace, Law and Justice has its first secretary uh, on Novogrudska, by which he met Yaroslav Kaczynski. A more striking case is the old GDR. Back in the 1990s, one of our students at Berkeley published an article, political scientist, claiming that East Germans had become a new ethnicity. I thought he was crazy. I really thought it was a crazy argument. I said, 
uh, look, these are Germans, and they have, they've been so for centuries. Uh, but we are seeing now, and I thought of his article recently, reading more about the current East German society, that f 40 years of communism actually had, in some ways, as much um, heft as hundreds of years of other political development. Um, it seems that East and West Germans have become more differentiated than any two German societies that ever existed. Uh, and I'll just say as a final note from my stay in Budapest, that if you, were, you want to discover in many ways what socialism, state socialism was like, you'll find out what it was like uh, not simply by absorbing the messages of the House of Terror, but by being in the House of Terror and experiencing the process of going through that House of Terror. I hadn't been reminded of, social, of living in state socialism so starkly for some time. So I have um, some variations on a theme for my conclusion. I have a set of concluding remarks that I'll go to now. The theme is ethnic nationalism. So first, first comment, Eastern Europe is a, is a distinct region with identifiable features. Above all, this extraordinary sensitivity about history, this deeply shared belief that the world of conventions and tastes and cultures is deeply contingent, that everything in history, including nations, come and go. To say that East European nationalism has a primarily ethnic dimension over recent generations is not, however, to deny that places where nationalism is broadly understood in civic and political terms don't have a presence of ethnic nationalism intermixed and a potential to develop that dimension at the expense of the more inclusive civic kind. In Michael Ignatieff's book, um, Blood and Belonging, we read a deep questioning, in fact, whether British nationalism was as multicultural and cosmopolitan as it is cracked up to be. Um, this is within, there is also within British nationalism another species, which Michael refers to as Englishness, as he calls it, an antagonistically defined creed of an Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation locked in battle with continental Europe, the papacy, and the Catholic Irish. The tendencies in a given nationalism toward political and civic or toward cultural and ethnic can shift over time. So if English nationalism has been on the rise in a way that I think might have surprised Michael when he wrote his book in the early 1990s, German nationalism, thanks in part to legislation later in the, in the 1990s, has taken on a more civic tendency. And who knows what the situation will be in 100 years. For the time being, I think we have in East Central Europe an identifiable region of a certain predominance of a certain kind of nationalism. So I studied with a guy named Krzysztof Lewandowski in Krakow in the early 1980s, long ago emigrated to Chicago. He is now an American. If the opposite had happened, if John Connolly had gone to Poland and tried to become a Pole, no matter how well John Connolly would have, would have, would, would have perfected the Polish language, and I still have a long way to doing that, um, or gotten to know its history, I would not be considered part of, of, of the Polish nation as it is currently broadly understood. The ethnic nation is a nation reputedly with no beginning. Think of the differing understandings of national holidays. If July 1776 is celebrated as, as the beginning of the American nation, 1792, year one of the French nation, October and November of 1918 were not the beginnings, but the culmination of the Czech and Polish nations, which had supposedly always existed and were at that point finally rewarded with historical justice. But to go back to the English case, the fear of ethnicity under siege and perhaps disappearing is not unique to Eastern Europe at all. Um, such a fear, I think, stood behind support in North English small towns for Brexit. Um, and fears of loss of identity are currently strong among Protestants in Northern Ireland, people who have a very keen sense of threat uh, to ethnicity under siege. In the, in the 1990s, Michael Ignatieff talked to one man who lived close to the border of the Irish P Republic, Protestant within Northern Ireland, a man named Dick Sterrett. Mr. Sterrett chastised the English for no longer save it, singing God Save the Queen at the conclusion of uh, cinema in the movie houses. Dick said, they don't seem to have, have any story to tell, any song to sing. They don't seem to know who they are. I think Mr. Sterrett posed an important question for all of us. Does not every community that wants to have coherence, political or national community, need that common story, perhaps a common song? Nations are imagined communities, but more basically, if they are to succeed, they are collectivities in which people tell each other a common story about who they are. So my second point, now when I say such words, I know I sound conservative, and 
been accused of being conservative. But I think that fact signals a huge problem for liberals, the inability to speak about ethnic identity as if it were not something exotic and irrational. This inability has had huge costs to the, to the left and center for generations, usually going under the name populism. In the book, I date populism's challenge in East and Central Europe to the 1880s. Like today, it was neither left nor right, but began as a generational revolt of young liberals against the old liberals of the Viennese establishment. This is an argument taken from Karl Shorsky, by the way. The basic force behind the generational revolt was the perception that the older generation did not give a damn about the people. The people in the sense both of ethnicity, the German-speaking people, and social identity, the lower classes. The liberal establish establishment in the faraway capital was out of touch. Does that sound familiar? Over the decades, populists have overtaken liberals on the left, most recently in New Hampshire, and conservatives on the right. Fascism, I argue, was an extreme version of right-wing populism, consisting of a violent assertion of supposed rights of the nation understood precisely in this dual sense, ethnically and socially. So note that the Nazi government had a very strong, and we would even say by today's standards, progressive social policy toward people they considered to be part of the nation, excluding Jews. Fascism rose to mass movement in four places in interwar Europe. Germany, including Austria and Bohemia, Italy, Romania, and Hungary. What all these cases, these four cases had in common were arguments precisely on the extreme right of uh, extreme neglect, indeed contempt by elites in the faraway cities of common people. I think fascism has perhaps faded, but the argument that elites are contemptuous of the ethnic and social nation has not. Um, fourth point, there is an interesting paradox at work here in what I've said and what I've written. On the one hand, the fact that nations can indeed disappear as one sees when one looks at thousands of years of history, languages, nations, peoples coming and going. Um, the undoubted fact that nations, like everything, are contingent in some way. But on the other hand, that from the 1780s, the fact that this knowledge has translated into fear, mass fear, and spawned movements up and down the East European region, giving rise to what seems precisely the opposite of a contingent event, namely a pattern. So if nations are imagined communities, humans don't imagine them just as they choose. I think Jan Kolar and Ludovic Guy and the ultimate failures of their imagined communities of Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia are evidence of that. People can imagine nations, but that doesn't mean that the nations actually cohere. And if nations are daily plebiscites, the choice on the ballot has generally been just one, and those who might have opted for national indifference, strong current in the, in the historiography, discovered that this choice, the choice of national indifference, was a choice that was a combination of irrelevance and meaninglessness that didn't mean anything in, in, their, in, in their political, uh, social, and cultural contexts. My final and fifth point, still I think it has to be emphasized, and this is very important, that this fear that a language and culture may disappear is not a mass consciousness at any, at any point, or very rarely is a mass consciousness. Average people may not and are not concerned. In the 1780s, the average Hungarian or Czech was not worried about Joseph II and his, Joseph II and his cultural policies. The people who really cared about nationalism were the politicized, people involved in public affairs, political preachers and prophets, usually self-appointed prophets, people who spend their lives making arguments and browbeating the skeptical. As I mentioned, all the early heroes of the national movements, this really goes across boundaries, were theologians of one sort or another. Ireland, I think, is again a very interesting case. Precisely at the point the zealots, like Yeats, were building up the national culture in the late 19th century, thousands of average people were ceasing to speak Irish with their children because it had no practical benefit. And today, maintaining the Irish language is not a huge concern for the average person. Nevertheless, the language remains a central and crucial element of Irish national identity that no one can ignore in the political realm. It acts as a kind of ultimate currency in the corridors of power. Until a few months ago, in fact, until a few weeks ago, the local legislature in Northern Ireland called the Stormont, uh, just outside of Belfast, was adjourned for three years, partly over dispute 
over the use of Irish in the parliament, a language that virtually no one understands. And even those who do speak hardly use on an everyday basis, even with other speakers of that language. The lesson is, and has come to be understood as, the fact that no Irish politician can stand against the Irish language. Now, what does this remind you of? It reminds me of the predicament, largely self-inflicted, of today's Republicans in the US and the inability of any one of them to speak obvious truths. It's as though a higher logic had taken over. No one will stand up to, 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 to Donald Trump because on the right, at least, he has cornered the market on the language of ethnic nationalism. But that's not the final word on the subject. Maybe something slightly more hopeful. Nationalism, after all, was originally, if you recall, much more a left of center than right of center phenomenon. It was revolutionary in its day. And its causes for liberation, for rights, later against fascism, and for democracy are by no means conservative. So perhaps when I say that there seems to be only one choice of the nation as a daily plebiscite, I was inaccurate. Politics is, or should be, uh, a frequent, maybe not daily, but a frequent plebiscite about what kind of nation one wants to celebrate. Does one favor a nationalism that relies upon fear, but not upon inspiration? Does one favor a nationalism that is curious about other nations rather than hostile to them? that relies upon culture as a way to unite rather than divide, that endeavors to break down walls rather than to build them. If there is no clear distinction between ethnic and civic nationalism, the political left, that is if all nationalisms in some ways are a melange of the two, the political left should by no means give up the field of ethnic nationalism, so-called ethnic nationalism to the right. Why should the left not be concerned about culture, about ethnicity, about songs? common songs, about symbols, about the deep and the more proximate common stories that might hold a people together in argument. If the left insists on treating nationhood as an imagined and mostly unfortunate fiction, I think it will continue to be reminded that for most people, in very many places, people who cast ballots on a regular basis, nationhood is seen as a fact. And if the left continues as it has, the ballots of those people will tend to go elsewhere. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and thank you for your attention.